Welcome to the Designated Drinker Show, the podcast that's raising the bar on craft cocktails. I am your host, Louise Sullison. With me, as always, is my very talented friend, who I consider a national treasure, the mixtress DC Gina. Hi, Louise. How are you today? Good. Where are you at, love? Well, I'm in the restaurant today, which is kind of nice. Uh, it feels a little different, but it's good. Uh, I'm at uh, Cross Street from the Capitol at Buffalo and Bergen. So if you're listening and you need a cocktail, you can come here and have one. Exactly. Well, you know, you're kind of where your location seems to be apropos for today's um, show. Um, You know, the fact that we have you and all these other national treasures right in our own backyard, I think sometimes we just forget and we take them for granted. Um, So let's open the show with a little bit of American history, shall we? Um, But oddly, I'm going to take you to jolly old England to get there. So do you have your passport handy? I mean, clearly not being used (laughs) currently, but yes. (laughs) All right, here we go. So British globetrotter James Smithson uh, was quite wealthy. And at the time of his death in 1827, he had ordered that all of his assets that um, he had actually inherited be um, be given to his his nephew, Henry James Dickinson. But there was one twist. In the event that Dickinson died without having any of his own heirs, the entire estate was to be turned over to the United States. So that the country, odd coming from a guy who's, you know, British, but it was so that the United States could build a hub for the increase and diffusion of knowledge. Took all of it, all of his money. Um, So I know, I know, because I mean, just imagine this endowment or it, uh, from way back then, from 1827, is what gave birth to the Smithsonian Institute that we know today. Another odd twist, James Smithson never stepped foot in the United States. Not a lot. (laughs) He never made it here. So a little bit more about the Smithsonian. So among their collection of over 138 million objects, works of art and specimens, is the top hat of our 16th president, good old Abraham Lincoln. And it's said that um, this is exactly where Abe kept all his important papers. He tucked them up into his hat which I think is very funny because if you think about it, he was keeping all of his important tidbits of information top of mind. Oh. I thought you'd love my dad, I bad love, dad joke. Oh, that was good. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. I hear it. <laughs> Too bad you're not a dad because I would go right into the dad jokes. <laughs> <laughs> you mean you just should go into the trash? Is that what you're trying to say? No, the dad <laughs> jokes are the best. Good clean humor. That's lost. It's a lot a lost art. <laughs> I try. I try. Um, so speaking of all things, you know, all these interesting things that we can find at the Smithsonian brings me to today's designated drinker. He's the curator of political history at the National Museum of American History, John Grinspan. Welcome to the show, John. Oh, thanks for having me. Uh, it's, it's great to be here and to finally get to talk about all the alcohol that comes up in American political history. Well, you know, it's enough to drive you to, dr- to drink. That's for damn sure. Um, so we, we are both, Gina, are really excited to have you here. I mean, a historian that knows all things about American politics coming out of D.C., totally make totally fits you're all about culture which gina and i like to think we fit into that space (laughs) but we know it's all about booze so you make like the perfect designated drinker yeah and and i'm pretty good at drinking too honestly so i have been practicing so we'll uh, we'll have to make that official one so we can get on the other side of this upside down world and sit down and have a cocktail or two or five absolutely so exactly what is a curator no one knows. That's the beauty of the job. Uh, you can kind of turn your passion into all the manifestations of research and scholarship and material culture that you can. And as curator of political history, the fundamental challenge of democracy is how do you get people to engage? And often in American history, alcohol is the way you get people to engage from presidents with their kind of signature cocktails of their own to campaigns that are run out of the back room of saloons throughout American history from, you know, temperance to gilded age lobbyists it's it's kind of all layered alcohol is layered throughout american history and um considering my job is to try to teach the american people and the american public about this story alcohol comes up a lot 
<laughs> it's it's kind of the final piece of the puzzle, huh? Yeah, I mean, it's the or, or it's the kind of the the lubricant that gets everything going. You in in terms of people's social lives, in terms of getting people interested. You you go through our collections at the museum and. You walk into the secure room and the first thing you see are large glass cases full of shot glasses and beer mugs that different campaigns throughout American history have used to get out the vote from FDR to, you know, uh, Rutherford B. Hayes. Throughout American history, alcohol plays a key role, either consuming it or opposing it. And so it just keeps coming up. That's cool. That's cool. So it, there is there a whole like uh, special liquor cabinet <laughs> back in the closet of the Smithsonian then? <laughs> you know, I don't know if there's any actual booze I've been looking. I guess if you go to the different curators offices, you can always find some. But um, there, there's certainly we have an amazing program in terms of studying the history of beer in America and a great curator working on that. But uh, in political history, it just comes up a lot, either support or opposition. You remember all these presidents are human beings and, and a lot of them relax at the end of the day with gin or porter or hard cider. And the people who voted for them or opposed them, you know, they, they went to the saloons, they went to the taverns, they expressed themselves. And often you could run a campaign around cider or whiskey or beer. So it, it, it comes up a lot, not just candidate you want to have a beer with, but the candidate who might give you a beer if you vote for him. So it, uh, it goes all the way back. That's so interesting. That's my favorite part of history for the elections. <laughs> Cocktails were like specifically served in the morning and then there were drinks in the afternoon and like you would have a hard drink after 12 o'clock. There's so many cocktails that come up in my cocktail books of different presidents that it's, it's amazing. Like, and you read these stories, like they'll be outside of like voting booths and they'll give you a morning cocktail, which would have been like a two, three ounce for free in order for you to vote. So there'd be people that, you know, so Pennsylvania Avenue is a perfect example. Pennsylvania Avenue was, was, was all in a canal for a very long time yeah. until they drained it. And um, not Pennsylvania. Yeah, no, that, that's Pennsylvania and Constitution. Constitution was on the canal yes, yeah. before they drained it. And there was a lot of saloons, but there was also voting booths where people would go and, and cast their votes. And they would have lined with different cocktails. And it's kind of... Uh, not different cocktails, a cocktail who vote for your candidate. And I literally am like, that is the greatest thing that we lost in American history. Like, I feel like what a fun book to put together or, you know, just like the cocktails that were served. Like, there's only a very few that were um, at least that show up in my cocktail books. So like, like, I would love to know any of them that you may know, like definitely the ingredients because there's only like, some that just show up as like, um, you know, somebody that would have uh, you would have been voting for. Yeah, I, I know a couple. Um, they, they come up a lot. And uh, and also voting used to happen in saloons. I mean, for the first hundred years of American democracy, there's no the government is not running elections. The parties run elections and they choose where to hold them. And there aren't government buildings throughout most of the country. Most towns have a schoolhouse, a saloon, maybe some churches. They're not there's not like a really full sense of kind of institutions other than the saloon. So often you'd go vote in the saloon and the, the election judge would be drinking beer all day long or drinking cocktails all day long. So you, so you, you'd want to vote in the morning to make sure your vote got, uh, got, got counted properly because by the end of the day, you know, there, there are 10 drinks in or whatever. Uh, but there are well-known cocktails from different political machines from the, from the late 19th century, like the Ward 8 up in Boston. Uh, the, the Manhattan was, was supposedly made dedicated to Samuel Tilden, who, who ran in 1876. Oh, interesting. Uh, I mean, if you think I about it. I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah. It was uh, supposedly put together as an honor for him when he was governor. Now, he wasn't the greatest politician in American history, but he, he was an interesting guy. And he's the one who had the popular vote, won the popular vote and so essentially had the election stolen out from under him. And they said, well, he, at least he has the Manhattan. You know, he can, he can console himself with that. Pretty Drowned good. his sorrows, if, if, if you would. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, I mean, it, democracy is social. It's, it's about who you know. It's about who you can get over to your side. It's not, obviously, money plays a role. Obviously, power plays a role. But part of it in a big new country is social power and social capital. And if you run a saloon and you know the people in your neighborhood and you get along with them, that goes a long way to running a political machine and getting elected. So what motivates people is this kind of fundamental question. And alcohol... Alcohol can make strangers get along in a way that, or, or hate each other in a way that other, many, few other things can. 
Wait, I, Jean, I'm sure you've seen that a couple of times on a bar stool to between a couple of bar stools that you were serving. Easy for me to say. Sounds like I need a uh, cocktail, yeah. huh? <laughs> yes, absolutely. That's definitely something that happens. However, you know, I own a bar, so I feel like this is like a good stepping stone, right? No, I'm just kidding. You should run for office. You need a political machine. That's the next step. John, you're not the first one to tell her that. I guarantee it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Rudyard Kipling traveled through America in the 1880s and he, he said he got sick. He would ask people, how'd you get into politics? He got sick of meeting saloon keepers because everyone he met in every position. Oh, well, he used to run a saloon. So this is you probably know a lot of people who would vote for you, Gina. Maybe maybe this next election is the one for you. Yeah. Right. <laughs> we keep trying, John. We keep trying. Yeah. So Ward wait, six, so, right? so I know about the ward yeah. for sure. Right. Oh. I did not know about the Manhattan. Give me another one. Give me give us give our listeners one more. I wrote down a list. Let me double check here. Uh, the gin Ricky. Supp- oh, OK. A good one is the McKinley's Delight. I don't know if anyone drinks a McKinley's Delight anymore, but um, McKinley ran for president in 1896. And you have this problem because there are these candidates And they're kind of respectable upper class guys a lot of the time. But the machines that run political campaigns are often working class saloons. So you have to find a way to make the the working class saloon runner get along with this kind of elite politician. You come up with a nice cocktail. Suddenly everyone's friends. Right. And these people who come from different classes, different backgrounds can get along. So the McKinley's delight is rye whiskey, like three ounces of that with sweet vermouth and cherry brandy. There's a lot of cherry in in some of these are really sweet. Uh, Oh, I'm sorry. And also a dash of absinthe thrown in there. Just, uh, just to add to that. Yeah. Wow. I feel like that drink has a, another name um, that they've changed it. But they, I, I know that drink that you're talking about. And the cherry brandy has been subbed in for cherry herring. Mm. And like it comes from the scotch drink as well. Like where they did the scotch drinks with the blood and sands. But like I feel like I that. It's so familiar, right? You just change one ingredient and then name it after the politician. Yeah, yeah, that's an easy way to make friends. I, the you, have one to rem- you have to remember that time in 1996 in this country, you really didn't have that many choices of refined alcohol, right? So you were drinking brandy. It wasn't until 1900s, 1910, that gin made a huge, humongous, like, come to the United States and everyone started drinking it in vogue. And then 1919, Prohibition hit, so... I have a question for you then. There's this cocktail or I'm sorry, a punch that I know they used to drink at political parties in D.C. And it just never made sense to me. They called it Washington Punch and it was whiskey, rum, red wine, champagne, sugar and lemon. I could never imagine putting whiskey and rum and red wine. And like, doesn't that can can you see how that would work? It, It never made sense that anyone. It just seems like you're dumping everything into the punch bowl at that point. So Washington was very influential to what everybody drank and everything. And it would, it's interesting to think about him in a different way as an importer, as somebody that could do all those kind of things. And like, you know, rum distillery, we all know that Washington made whiskey. We all know that Washington had, um, you know, wine. He made wine, whether it was good or not. Sugar, sugar and lemon make everything taste fine because as much sugar as you add, you can double it and turn that wine into like a syrup. Um, and then the rum... You know, there, it's just to say that, you know, he traveled so much and had so many friends on boats that the rum just came naturally. So I think it was also part of the affluence of getting champagne from France. And, you know, when he was friends, um, you know, obviously Lafayette and, you know, you kind of go through like who his, um, you know, friends were. This might have been a way for them to put everybody together in, in a bowl and kind of make the camaraderie of it. Right. You have to like kind of think in that time what people were bringing as gifts what they were producing, what they had, and what showed affluence. So a lot of punches are not good. But, a lot of, <laughs> but, but they have reasoning of why they were put together. Oh, that's really yeah. So it's like American history in a bowl, kind of. Um, do you want a job at the Smithsonian? You- <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, was, I would love to, pl- I w- I'd love to play, um, play with the Smithsonian and do cocktails when we're allowed to do that again, or at least do something. I, I, I've been fortunate enough to be part of like Phil Green's events at the Smithsonian. And um, I've done some stuff at um, archives just as a guest, you know, a guest bartender for an event. So, you know, I think know, he's offering you a, a, like a, a day job, Gina, <laughs> like what? a day walker. I think he's talking about a day walker situation. <laughs> no, that's what I mean. Like, I would love to talk and like. First of all, I think the history cocktails are amazing. We play this game. Bartenders play this game, uh-huh. and you could always and you can do it, and it's really fun. It's like you take all of the bottles behind your bar, uh-huh. 
and, I, and, and you have to be a history buff to play it, but you can play every world war, world war slash war slash event with different liquor bottles and move them around like almost like a chessboard. <laughs> it's like and then eventually you might win the war depending on what you have left in your bottle. And at the end, you're pretty shit-faced. I'm not going to lie. You get pretty drunk. <laughs> However, it is a very good game to learn your history because you can make powerful moves based on, say, you took a Winston Churchill because he came from London, and then you paired him against, I, I don't know, uh, Marie Antoinette, right, because she was the whatever. And it doesn't matter the year that we played it. It didn't, have, didn't matter what year or time they were together. You just put them and push them forward, and then you could win. But you got to awesome. know all the history. Yeah. That is awesome. <laughs> or be creative and sell the sell whatever you're selling. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it's like 3 o'clock in the morning and everyone's like in the bag. You're like, absolutely, <laughs> King Henry was like, and they'll be like, oh, yeah, you're right. Meanwhile, you're like, there's no way that those two people met each other 300 years in between. <laughs> but it's so a John, fun, it's just, you know, the days of the salon, like running salons of like people getting together and having a bigger thought process and putting the artist and the common person and the, and the, you know, the political figure and everything are so far beyond, you know, like people don't, don't do it anymore. And I feel like there's a lot to learn from the history of cocktails and how people came together and enjoyed very common and very simple things to have bigger ideas. Absolutely. So, is, John, tell us, tell us a little bit about your books. Oh, <laughs> um, so I, I'm about to publish my, my second book. Uh, my first book was called The Virgin Vote, and it was on young people in politics in the 1800s. And we, we kind of imagined that young people didn't care about politics at all until like the 60s and still don't care about politics. But really, if you go back 100, 150 years, young people play a really crucial role in politics. And politics played a really crucial role in young people's lives because there aren't that many paths to adulthood back then. So if you can get involved in the political machine, if you can help run a campaign, you can prove kind of your adulthood and you can get connections and you can also prove something to yourself about your adulthood. And certainly back then only men could vote and there's mostly white men voting, but women and African-Americans kind of gravitated to politics in ways that they could the same way, arguing the issues, reading the newspapers, giving speeches. Uh, there are a lot of female bartenders out there. So, um, and they often, all of these young people often got connected through, through alcohol. They'd, they'd hang out in the saloon and meet the big party boss and run favors for him. And that's kind of how, how they got through things. Or they, they'd turn out for a, a rally and they'd get to drink whiskey or hard cider at the political rally. So the alcohol was all tied up through it. This, um, this second book I, I'm about to publish is called The Age of Acrimony, How Americans Fought to Fix Their Democracy, 1865 to 1915. And there's this period in the late 1800s when Americans are worried that democracy is dying, that just the whole system is falling apart, partisanship, kind of ethnic conflict. People are really worried about the future of the system. And there's a fight over the future of democracy. And it's often fought out through alcohol and also through class between these kind of working class political machines who are based in saloons and are really often very pro-alcohol and kind of upper middle class reformer types who want to clean up politics, but also want to get the working class people to stop voting. And they really target saloons and alcohol as a result. And one of the results is prohibition. Now we think about prohibition, we think about alcohol, we think sometimes about like gender politics, but part of it is about voter suppression of working class people. You close down their saloons, you close down their, their institutions, they're less likely to vote. So it's just interesting how We've seen these troubles in our democracy before and how often they're tied up in issues of alcohol and class and all these other things. And every once in a while, you come across a great cocktail recipe you never heard of before. That's amazing. I can't wait to get your books. I was trying to get, um, Gina, I have to admit, I was trying to get John to send me the books ahead of time and I'll still work on that. Um, oh, but So tell us, tell us what's in... It's okay. It's okay. Now you just have to tell me more. I could, I can, um, I tell me more about them basically I in, in your, don't. do it. Yeah, keep talking, <laughs> please. I, I think it's fascinating. Yeah. Well, I, I might be telling you things you, you guys already know, but like the saloon is the anchor of the community for a lot of people, especially for people who aren't well off. You can get a free lunch at a saloon. You can have a address, a mailing address at a saloon. You voted the saloon. You can, if you're like a laborer in the 1800s, or early 1900s, and you're an immigrant and you don't know that many people and you don't know that many connections, this is, this is the thing outside of work and your tenement where you can meet people, you can talk, you can interact. Uh, a lot of them are beer-focused saloons where they drink especially kind of lager and Pilsner beers. But um, 
uh, especially among Irish political campaigns, there's a, uh, there's, there's a ton of whiskey and you can always drink these kind of fancier cocktails they're inventing. Um, some people say they came to America and they realized they loved America the first time they walked into a bar that they, they got off the ship. They said, this place isn't that great. And they walked into a saloon. It's, it's all these cocktails. It's finally appointed. There are people arguing politics and they realize what they, what they love about America. Um, it's something a little bit we've, we've lost the saloon culture. And, and I think we lost some community along the way. I mean, there were bad parts of it too, but, but uh, it, it's a different world kind of. And, and in some ways we're a little bit poorer for not having it anymore or as much. I, well, especially right now, huh? Yeah, I, absolutely. I agree. <laughs> I agree. No, that it, my, it, that's, that's my argument, right? Like that you can have, you need to mix people together in order to get a bigger idea, a new idea, something different. Absolutely, because you see beyond yourself. You hear another voice, another point of view. You're exposed to something maybe that you hadn't thought of before, even even has something that could be as big as it's never touched your life. You have no idea that that was an issue. And here you are just sitting next to your fellow man. You never know who they are. Uh, I think that's still true today. I've, I'm definitely a, a, a bar fly I guess and Gina will tell you I never made a stranger and I end up talking to everyone and I position myself I literally position myself at a bar in order to talk to the max amount of people possible <laughs> that's, that's the truth that's how I met her it's amazing is that true well I am the absolute opposite that's why I became a historian so I could hide in the archives but um at the end of a day of research you still have to drink right? <laughs> so speaking of a drink what do you think Gina I know we should definitely have a drink, but I do have a question. When is the, when does your second book come out? Oh, that's my favorite kind of question. Uh, April 27th. So it's um, you could pre-order it now, but it should be out in the next couple of months. I, I feel like this is going to launch you. I think you have to come here and sit on the porch at 240 and we'll sell your books one day and we'll make some cocktails out of your book. Oh, I, I'm there. I like I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm, a block, I'm a couple blocks away, so I'll be right over. I really feel like this would be, so I called my Buffalo and Bergen location for those listening, 240, that that's the address. Oh. But I think that would be such a great thing to do in the spring and, and kind of refresh people's like ideas of what drinks are and, you know, reading a book and, you know, coming out with your mask on and, you know, having a cocktail socially distanced and, and, and pick up a cocktail book or something. Yeah. We'll have a designated drinker meets uh, what do you think, Louise? Is that a bad idea or a good idea? I think it's awesome. I can't wait to do that pop-up. Yeah. We're talking, John will be all about the history. You'll be all about the cocktails. And I'll just be the social butterfly. <laughs> <laughs> and, and also, all I, right. I, I, uh, yeah, I know we're all on Zoom now. It, it's hard for me to see. It, throughout American history, the one thing that comes back is drinking together. Like, it might not be a saloon. The culture changes. It it's hard for me to not see how, how we people are going to want to congregate and interact and drink booze in the future. Exactly. Exactly. We'll get there. We will get there. I hope so. And now uh, we're going to get there a little faster than some right now, because Gina's going to show us how to make a cocktail. I, I am going to do that. All right. All right. So we are going to make a red lion and it is a classic cocktail. It's one of the oldest cocktails and it actually incorporates gin and um, Grand Marnier. And what I love about that is you can play the history game with them, right? Because you have the two, some of the oldest liquors that we know and some of the original when they became refined. You have a brandy, which is Grand Marnier. It's an orange flavored brandy, most like, most, most definitely. And then you have gin. <laughs> yeah. Then you have a gin, which is one of the oldest from Geneva. Then it went to Old Tom and now you have gin. And this cocktail lovingly puts it all together. And I think that you want to remember a little bit of history and something that um, kind of brings you back a little bit in time. This is definitely a very classic way to do it. And it incorporates the orange and the lemon because the lime doesn't come on to history until a little bit after both of those two things. So you have the lemon, you have the orange, or you have the orange actually, and then the lemon comes to this country. And then we get the lime, and we all know what happens with the lime when it hits Washington, D.C., gets used in a whiskey and soda, becomes the Ricky. Thank you, Colonel Joe, we really appreciate that, and the sailor that landed on those steps, right? So, I'm gonna turn this down so everyone can see what we're doing. And we're gonna start off this drink, it's the simplest drink. You're gonna just take one ounce of gin, and you can use a nice dry gin. I'm using Forge. You can use anything that's dry. There's nothing with any um, residual sweetness. Even though it's a London dry style, it is made in the U.S. in California. And then we are going to add one ounce of Grand Marnier. 
And the difference between a good bartender and a great bartender is somebody that measures and takes a minute to pour that way, right? Mm. So the second thing we're gonna add to that is one half an ounce of lemon juice. And then we're going to use one, sorry, half an ounce of orange. And I don't have any orange juice right now that is not juice because we just went up through the morning. So I'm going to squeeze this fresh into the glass or into my jigger to make sure it's a half an ounce. And then I will use it. So just give me one second. We're gonna put the orange in there. Flesh side down, as we all know. I juiced ahead of time. Well, I love that. We, uh, we only had blood oranges in my house, so mine is an extra red line here. Which is amazing. When you use blood orange, blood oranges are absolutely lovely. They're one of my absolute favorite things. Okay, I was worried and you'd I, yell at me. Yeah, they're just, just a short, it's just a short time period for that, right? <laughs> but doesn't it make more sense to use blood orange to make a red line? Anyway, so you're gonna put in half an ounce of orange, and it doesn't get any more simple, right? That's it. You're gonna add ice, we're gonna shake, and we're gonna serve it up. All right, so give a little love tap on the top, which I tell everybody. And then you wanna take it and you wanna shake it on the side and don't move your arms. Get it nice and frothy. And we have our glass chilling. So we're gonna toss it out. And we are going So Gina, what is the trick that I always have this problem? So, ready? So when, the gla when it's tilted this way, yeah. you turn it around and you hit it on the opposite side. Whatever side it, just... it is, you palm it. <laughs> you move, you can move? I got it, you got there it, you I go. got it. <laughs> so now we're gonna uh, strain it. And here's one of my favorite things to, like, to demonstrate is that when you're pouring, you wanna get enough height that it almost looks like you're pouring a ribbon. So hence the term pouring ribbons. Because that means that your drink is well blended and it's ready to go. So now, the, the ever question, do you have to flame this drink? Well, you know, it's kind of up to you. I love a flamed cocktail for the presentation. Does it change the cocktail? It does not, but does it make the bartender look like a magician? <laughs> it does. So we're gonna, we're gonna try one. And I'm gonna show you when you cut your orange, what you wanna do, you wanna make sure that you're not getting any of this, it's not touched, right? Even though you see it, it's not on there. Because if you do have anything other than the pith, what will happen is, is that the drink will go out, it, the flame will go out because it's getting juice. Because all you wanna use is the oil. So you take rind side out between your two, between your thumb and your um, pointer finger, that's your pointer finger, I guess, right? And- Index? This is your index, isn't it? What's your, what's your first finger called? Your index finger. It is? Yeah, because okay. that's your so middle your finger. pointer finger? I think your index that's... finger is your pointer finger. It's the yep. same, right? Okay. I think. Yeah. Uh, now I, now I I'm think questioning. So. <laughs> All right, so thumb and your index finger, and if you have children and you sing the song, it's your pointer finger, I don't know. I think I've lost my mind since I've had two kids. Anyway, you're gonna take it, now you're going to take your, your flame, and you're gonna kind of warm it up, and then you just give it a little squeeze, and that's it. Nothing crazy. You get really good at it. You can make it really, really big. You want to uh, warm it up a little bit longer. You can make it go even larger. But I'm trying to show you on the screen and on my computer. So it's a little different. See, Ooh. there you go. That you see what the, so when you're not trying to get it on a little screen, you can make it get <laughs> I'm terrified it's going to zest my um, eyebrows. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, not a hack, folks. Been here a long time. Anyway. Cheers. Cheers. Let's see that drink, John. Cheers. Okay. Let's try this drink. Oh, that's good. Simple. Simple, easy, and this would have been a very, very traditional morning cocktail. Very <laughs> oh, I bright, can drink this. Easy mm -hmm. to drink. Done. Um, I can, can see drinking this. you imagine they still said this was a good thing? You can go to work. Like you would go to, you would stop at a bar, get a morning cocktail, a pick me up and go to work. I, I just can't Ooh. even believe that that's, 
how life was. It's so great to think that. I know. They, they had a 11sies too, which is at 11 o'clock. You, you pass a bottle around the work. You, you know, you take a little morning break halfway through work. Wait, and yeah. I've never heard of this before. Tell me one more time. What I is never, that? I never heard of it either. And then I read about it and it, suddenly I started seeing it everywhere. 11sies is it's like a, like a snack in the middle of the morning, but your snack is whiskey. You pass around a bottle of whiskey at, at work or whatever. Hmm. See, I used to get um, so creative director in advertising in the creative department. I had the liquor cabinet. I had the refrigerator and all the mixers and I brought glasses in and not saying that we had 11 Z's. But if I had known, I would have found a reason to make that happen. Um, but yeah, I always had cocktails. If we are working late, you need to have a drink or two. I think if I'll you keep up. your caffeine level with your alcohol, you should be good, right? It's Gina, John is our perfect, is our new best friend because he gets yeah. us. He gets us. That's exactly how we live. It's, uh, what was the t-shirt we're going to keep making? It's going to be caffeine. Caffeine. Caffeine and tequila. Yeah, coffee, tequila. Co- coffee, 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 tequila, 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 tequila. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, literally. Start over again. I'll be, I'll, be, exactly. I'll be very happy with just that combination. Maybe do a little espresso shot and then, I mean, they do it all over the world. It's, it's just in this country that we find it to be so crazy. Like, it's so nutty to think that you'd have a little, and is that in your coffee in the morning or, or a little whiskey? I mean, you go to Ireland, you go to, you know, go to London, go, you know, they have their tea. They have like all the different uh, cordials that go in tea. And you're like, oh, you know, it's not like this. It's not some kind of wild idea we've come up with. They've been doing this forever, just yeah. quietly. Yeah. And it's a uh, it's prohibition that did it like we the culture used to have a lot of this before prohibition and coming out the other end. They took alcohol. You could drink it now, but only in very specific contexts, very specific rituals. And, and they kind of separated it out from the rest of life. And I don't know. I, I think that's kind of a shame. Um, one of my favorite things to collect is the. um and then, I, and then I will never talk about that. Like, I'm such a nerd if I go to a store or like a vintage store or something or even like, I, you know, an old, whatever, it doesn't matter. I love the prescriptions for alcohol. Yeah. And I love state by state how they change because that was what was available. <laughs> and then it would be the same thing that they would be like prescribing it for. But it's by like, so say you were in Maryland, everything was for rye. You had a stomach ache, headache, it didn't matter. They would just like subscribe rye to you. If you're in New York, they would give you options between gin and um, and some whiskey, like a local whiskey, like um, like on the Hudson Valley side. Or if you were in like, um, apparently there was like a maple, uh, like a maple liquor that they made during Prohibition, and you could get like a maple style gin in like New Hampshire and Maine. It was just crazy. I we, loved it. We have some of those bottles in the Smithsonian. They're still full from like, you know, 1925 or whatever. And I, oh, we haven't cool. had an excuse to crack them open, but maybe, maybe one day. We- Literally, that should be the best fundraiser ever. <laughs> you should yep. like come in and you can, I'll make one cocktail from each <laughs> error. And that costs you whatever. <laughs> And we'll, we'll do a live podcast too. See, I'm just, I just want to be the socialite. I got to make sure I work myself in there. <laughs> There's not much more purpose for me being there other than I'm just a whole lot of fun, damn it. <laughs> President, President's Day is coming up and you have this, this red lion, this awesome gin cocktail. I think about which presidents might have particularly enjoyed a gin cocktail. And uh, the, the two I was thinking about were, um, we don't think much about Martin Van Buren, but uh, he, he was the first president to not speak English growing up. He was from Dutch immigrants and grew up speaking Dutch. And he, they drank, I think they call it Scheidem, which is like gin, basically early gin or, or Genevieve or whatever. Um, so I think he might've gotten a kick out of it. And FDR also was, was known for his, his gin cocktail. So I think he might've, and had his own martini recipe and everything. So he might've, he might've enjoyed the red line. He is one of my absolute, so you can go to FDR's, you know, his house in, uh, in Georgetown. Yeah. The best part of that whole tour for me is his liquor, the liquor mm. cabinet in the basement and how prohibition hits and he's no longer the president. And they move down to, they, they show all of the liquor that left the White House and went to his private residence. And like the bottles that they still have there, like my eyeballs fall out of my head between the con- the Cointreau, the original Cointreau bottles, and then they have all of this different like gins that I've never even seen the labels. People take pictures of those labels just to find the product. 
he's the only president I could think of that I would actually want to drink with. I mean, most of these guys uh, don't really want to meet, don't really want to interact with. And, and even some of the ones you like better weren't big drinkers. Like, like Lincoln would be nice to meet, but he didn't really enjoy alcohol that much. But FDR was big into his cocktails and seems like a nice guy to interact with. So he's, he's probably top of the list for that. So if you in your uh, it, is it your 12 people in heaven dinner? Is that what that is? Would he be one of those people at the table? I guess. I mean, maybe maybe he'd be. A, you never know who'd be a difficult person, right? Like you can't tell who you'd actually interact with and enjoy. But he seems top for our presidents, which isn't the greatest list of people to drink with. Um, he'd be top <laughs> of the list, right? Oh, that's I awesome. So. I mean, I guess a beer with Obama would be nice, but not not a cocktail, probably. No, he seems like he'd be a cheap drunk. <laughs> Obama? Okay, I can't. I can't yeah, say things like that. But you, uh, you no, no, can... like he'd be like one in, and he'd be tipsy. Like he just seems like no. you know he wouldn't be. I, I think he'd be yeah. the, he's the other way. He'd be ten beers in with no effect, just as cool and calm and collected as he always is. R- rumor, the rumor mill in the in the bar world is that he definitely drinks beer, but then he enjoys a scotch from time to time at the end. So. That that's, you know, that's from, you know, years of bartending and enjoying drinks at the Monocle myself. Mm. And it's my favorite bar to go to. They make, you know, the drinks are never, never you know what I'll tell you with, with the Monocle is it's in Washington, D.C. And if you ever come there, you will order a cocktail and it'll never be empty mm. from the time you get there to the time you leave. And on your check, it will always say the number one, but the price will change as, as the hours go on and how long you've been there. So if you ever have to go and submit that receipt, <laughs> it'll always say one. That's nice. It might be two hundred and seventy dollars, but it was only one. That's like so, um, you. Uh, maybe I'm wrong about this, and you can correct me. But I always heard that "freshen your drink." The expression is the same way that it's it's to not draw attention to the fact that you're on your twelfth drink. We're we're just freshening your drink. We're not giving you another <laughs> drink. That's that's absolutely a term, and I love that's that. Funny. And I love that, you know. They that place off the record here in Washington, D.C., they still keep that same. I, I find that if you've ever if you're going to travel to D.C. or you live in D.C. and you're listening to this podcast you, and the, when the bars reopen, you should go and enjoy those rooms because, you know, there's just so much history. And then obviously, you know, you could do um, the round robin bar, which is obviously where the lobbyist uh, term was coined during uh, President Lincoln's um uh, President Zeke is the White House. He took, he met people there, hence lobbyists. They were drinking. Round Robin Bar has been there. It's pretty awesome. So I, I don't know. I, I, I just, the, the sophistication of it was never, oh, you want another one? Oh, this is your third. Do you want to, you know, never, no judgment. Just, oh, would you like me to freshen that? Yeah. I think going into those cocktail bars, I always feel like I'm, I'm, Rubbing elbows with people that I'm like, oh, I have no idea who they are, but in my head, they're somebody else. They must be somebody because they're here, which is kind of funny. I'm there. Uh, <laughs> I don't turn that inward at all. Uh, but then I think you feel like you're kind of like going back in history or like going back in time a little bit. Um, they're really fun. Like to your point, Gina, they're, if you, when you come to D.C., those are definitely places when you, when you can safely do it. Um, definitely head up head to those bars. It's it's a it's a definitely unique D.C. experience. Yeah, absolutely. Spend the day in the museum and then go have a drink in, in a cocktail bar that's a little bit of a museum all to itself. Or we get a cocktail bar in the museum and we make that our goal for like 2030. Yeah, <laughs> well, there you go. Serve beer in the cafeteria and you'd see you'd see parents of exhausted school groups or, or families and they say, they, they serve beer here? Really? It's, but I don't know about cocktails. Maybe maybe that'll be the next step. I don't That's know, that, awesome. car- that carousel outside of the, um, on the mall seems like a great place to put a little cocktail. <laughs> just for the parents of family trips. Uh, honestly, they, as, yeah. they, as they go around, you just hand them another one. You <laughs> refresh in their drink as they go around. <laughs> <laughs> I've been on that, that merry-go-round with my children quite a bit when they get off and like, can we wait in line again? You're like, yeah, sure. It's 94 degrees. Let's do it. You know, I'm, I'm All right, before we go any further. Yes, to everything. Before we go yeah. any further, I want to do a little bit of our barkeeping, Gina. Yep. Where is everyone going to go to get this recipe? They are going to go to designateddrinker.show. Wait, what did you say? Designateddrinker.show for the recipes, how-tos, tips and tricks, and everything you learned about on this episode. Yep, we'll make sure we have um, links to your books, John. Um, So that way, yeah, yeah, everyone's got to 
I, I, I've read a few things. I, I've actually read more of your articles um, than, and then I can't wait to get my hands on your books. But yeah, I've read a couple of your articles. I think there was a line that made me really giggle. It was something you wrote for the New York Times, I believe, and it was about I have it here twenty, and I and I you wrote it in in. I, what I would assume would be somebody's accent. And it was one humorous joke that to get a political movement going, all it took was 20 barrels oh, yeah. of beer. I don't know what, in 30 yards of baloney. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I'm glad you, you didn't do the accent, honestly. Cause I, I yeah. Yeah. I barely um, speak English. So I try not to do that. They, to embarrass they, I mean, myself anymore. <laughs> yeah. They all had those, those horrible accents. Um, yeah. Cause uh, saloons used to have a free lunch and you'd go and you could for one beer, you buy five cent beer and you could eat, it wouldn't be the best free lunch in the world, but there'd be bologna, there'd be pretzels, there'd be all sorts of things, hard boiled eggs, you know, sometimes weird stuff, eel, calves foot, uh, the, the kind of things people ate back then that maybe we don't eat as much today, but are sometimes good. Uh, and so, you know, the idea of that joke is that like you, you run a political campaign, you need alcohol and snacks and that's all, that's all you need to get people excited. What has changed? I've done plenty of hostings for fundraisers, and I don't think that nothing has really changed. <laughs> the snacks have changed. They're a little bit better. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, I got into this job for the free snacks, so yeah, I, I appreciate yeah. that. No more bologna. <laughs> so I have a question for you. What is the coolest thing you've curated? Oh, uh, that's like a big thing. You mean like collected or uh, there's like a whole, a lot of thing, things you do. Um, I don't know. I, I like the variety. Like you in a single day, you can be writing a book in the morning, talking to you guys in the afternoon, talking to a school group after that, collecting objects from Abe Lincoln. And after that, it just there's not like one thing. It's just the kind of the ability to, to do so many different things. I, I really like. That's awesome. That's awesome. Is there a single object that you've come across that you're like that just like floors you? Yeah. I that, mean, like it's in your hand or like. Yeah. Uh, okay. I guess there are a couple. Um, Lincoln, the coffee cup Lincoln drank out of the night he was assassinated is, is in the museum and it, it kind of has some power, but it's, it's in the same cabinet with oversized mugs from the 1876 election that they used to get the voters out. The, the highest turnout election, I'm sorry, the highest turnout election in American history is 1876. 82% of eligible voters go to the polls. And one of the ways they did it was they had these huge kind of tankards of ale they were giving out. It said vote for Hayes on them. So I like those a lot. Uh, the shot glass is celebrating the end of prohibition. When, when prohibitions ended, they, they have the slogan like happy days are here again, which was FDR's slogan in, in 1932. And the shot glasses that say that uh, I, I kind of get a kick out of those, too. That's cool. That's, That's really so cool. cool. So, um, Gina, I tee it up to you. I think yep. it's time. So I have one last question, and this is a fun question. So, you know, all the young kids identify themselves with some sort of spirit animal, and they're like, this really represents me, and I, and I really identify myself with a bookworm because, you know, they get to eat the pages of history, and they're hanging out in a library, and that's what I, I put myself as. If you could identify yourself as one spirit ingredient, whether it's alcoholic or something you use, in the in cooking or cocktails, what would it be and why? Oh, that um, that is really tricky. <sighs> you guys should ask me this days ago. This is the kind of thing I'm going to mull over, walk around thinking about. Um, and it has to be a cocktail ingredient. No, it could be any ingredient that you could use in a cocktail or cooking. Just one ingredient that describes you. Okay, I. Maybe this is a weird answer, but I, I'm not sure what vinegar, but I, I, over the years, I used to think vinegar was kind of off-putting and disgusting. And, and I've kind of, I used to be a chef and I've kind of come to see the, like the beauty in acidity. And I like the idea of something at first seems really off-putting, but, but really when you think about it, it brings kind of a sweetness and a depth to cooking and, and, and cocktails that, that otherwise doesn't exist. So maybe, maybe some kind of vinegar. I don't know. That's amazing. That's a uh, great answer. Okay. See, John is perfect to hang out with us. He I likes know, some, he likes it. a little bitter, some acidity, and a little sweetness. It, that's you and me in 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 a bottle. Yeah, <laughs> that is a, that was probably one of the best answers I've had. Awesome. In a long time, so that's great. Yes, I, I'm proud of Absolutely. that. Absolutely. And sometimes, do people ever use vinegar in cocktails? Are there anything where you of have course. something like that? It's the that? base of shrubs. When you yeah. make cool. a shrub, nice. absolutely. <laughs> yeah, we can get into that in another. And we have to have you back. We'll yeah. get into it yep. again. Absolutely. It'll be the chef's side of curating. Well, I love it. Oh, yeah. There's a lot there, too. 
<laughs> it's it's just uh, controlling personalities who want to tell you what to eat and what to look at, you know? I, I, literally, I'm swooning for you. I love it. <laughs> well, I'm having a good time, too. Great. Oh. Crushes all around. Yeah. I Thanks, know. guys. Cheers. Cheers. Yeah, Cheers. The Designated Drinker Show is produced by Missing Link, a podcast media company that is dedicated to connecting people to intelligent, engaging, and informative content. Also in the Missing Link lineup of podcasts is Roger That, a podcast dedicated to guiding you through the haze of dementia, led by skilled caregivers Bobby and Mike Carducci. Now, if you're looking for a whole new way to enjoy the theater, check out Between Acts, an immersive audio theater podcast experience. Each episode takes you on a spellbinding journey through the works of newfound playwrights, from dramas to comedies and everything in between. Find Missing Link's League of Podcasts on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you find your podcasts. Don't forget to subscribe, download, and review the shows. Your review helps our shows reach new audiences. To find out more about Missing Link, visit missinglink.company. That's missinglink.company.